So uh, MRD, looking at the challenges and considerations, um, disclosures, but none of those are relevant for this particular. So my talk is broken in, into four parts. The utility of MRD and myeloma, uh, briefly covering the techniques, which Dr. Kapoor did a great job of already, testing analytics, clinical analytics, and then going back, back to the, one of your questions, is this a prognostic or predictive test? I think um, the way I would look at this in myeloma is that we actually, this is the paradigm for a surrogate marker. We have SPEP, IFE, uh, UPEP, urine protein electrophoresis immunofixation, free light chains, PET scans, MRI. So we have a lot of tests. And the question we always ask our house staff and students is if you're going to order a test, how will it change your management? So let's see what the data show. A lot of new drug approvals in myeloma. We now have seven, seven different categories of drugs, so it's a tremendous progress. Uh, but the initial treatment is really our best chance of getting disease control and durable remission. So here you see that the number of patients that get to uh, the end line of therapy continually diminishes. So there's an attrition issue, and there's this concept of, oh, I want to save my good drugs for later, but that doesn't always happen. And the duration of therapy also diminishes, so we're uh, diminishing returns with each subsequent relapse. And so our, our best chance of getting long-term disease control is really early on. And so when we think about response depth in myeloma, you heard about this, but just to, in terms of myeloma-specific, a uh, complete response is just one in 1,000 cells, so that's by our usual testing. Stringent complete response, the marrow doesn't show any clonal plasma cells, and then we get into these deeper MRD negativity at one in 100,000 to um, a million. And so does this matter? And we can see going back into the older days, CR after transplant, uh, the blue lines, these are the patients that did the best in terms of both PFS and OS. So Clearly, depth matters when you compare CR versus less deep responses. Um, and then when you go to the, even the newer technology, uh, PFS and OS of complete response without MRD negativity is actually no different than partial response. So it's only when you get MRD negativity that you see the PFS curve separates out in the OS, so highlighting the importance of this. And particularly when our newly diagnosed patients may have a PFS of around four years, if we're gonna do novel agents combinations, we've already gone from triplets to quads, do we have the time to wait four years to see if a novel therapy is improving outcomes? So that's really an opportunity for this MRD. And one of our most recent studies that highlights the benefits of looking at MRD is the so-called determination study. This is bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone with or without transplant. And you can see um, MRD status divided by treatment arm, risk status, and ISS stage. And you can see here uh, one of the questions being asked is, as uh, Gail mentioned too, transplant patients really don't want to lose their hair, be admitted. And the question is, if you have all of these novel agents, why do I need to do a transplant? And this study suggests that if you attain MRD negativity, it didn't matter which treatment arm you were in. That was more important than the actual arm. So MRD negativity if you didn't get transplanted, might be just as good. The problem, of course, is that more patients attain MRD negativity with transplant. Um, and, but this is raising the question in 2019, especially if we do quad-based therapy, can, and you attain MRD negativity, do those patients need to be consolidated with transplant? Risk status, also high-risk patients here in the dotted line, um, do do better if they're MRD negative than uh, even standard risk or MRD positive, so suggesting that like you saw in other hemalignancies, this might be a, a more important endpoint and ISS stage as well. One of the things I think, it, I, this is really fascinating to hear these multiple histologies, but what differentiates myeloma from a lot of these other diseases that you've heard about is this is actually hemalignancy with features of solid tumors. And there is a sig tremendous significance of prognostically of residual osseous disease. And this just shows different papers that have looked at MRI, MRI residual disease after transplant showing that um, your PFS and OS curves are statistically worse if you have residual radiologic disease by MRI. And this summarizes, again, the same story for PET. So unlike the other tumors, we can have patients who have macrofocal disease. You may have somebody who has no measurable disease in the blood or marrow, but they may have radiologically positive disease. So moving to now the testing analytics, and uh, why do we need to look at these? I mean, these are always seem like very dry topics that maybe pathologists should be doing. But I think as clinicians, if we're going to be using these tests and ordering them, we have to at least know some, a little bit about them. So we'll talk about sensitivity, specificity very briefly, because uh, Prashant did a great job. But I also want to talk about the applicability, the impact of having heterogeneous marrow, and some future techniques. So 
One of my biggest pet peeves in our myeloma clinical trials is we don't test everybody. So here's a good example of a study where um, if you looked at patients who had conventional measurable disease, obviously most of them had MRD um, uh, were, was also present. But there were 31 patients in this study who had measurable disease but were MRD negative by flow. So what does that mean? And, and in clinical trials in myeloma, if we only sample those that are suspected to be in CR, it inflates the specificity of the test. And so I think in myeloma, we really need to do a better job of testing more patients. Now, of course, that comes with the price of doing an invasive procedure on a patient where you already have radi uh, serologic measurements. So I think that's one of the challenges in myeloma. Um, and then I think you already heard about these pre-analytic issues. You need the baseline specimen for the next-gen sequencing, which you don't need for flow, and obviously you don't need these for PET scan. And the hemodilution is a big issue in myeloma. We know that when you do marrow in myeloma, the best marrow estimate is the core biopsy followed by aspirate, and flow is almost useless to assess bone marrow involvement because plasma cells are often lipophilic, and when you take them out of the marrow, you really underestimate the marrow involvement. Does the sensitivity matter? Absolutely. In that same RVD plus minus transplant study, you can see on the left that the patients who were MRD negative by flow did better than those who were positive. But when you take those who were MRD negative um, and you break them down by next-gen sequencing, you can further risk stratify them. And so again, highlighting that the difference between 10 to the minus fifth and minus, minus six has a clinical impact. And so if you're acting on a less sensitive test, well, how is that gonna impact your patients? Also, there's this issue of applicability to the patient. Can every patient be evaluated by both methods? And these are two examples by NextGen Flow, one of the largest studies, uh, over 1,000 patients with myeloma. About 12% of patients did not achieve the level of detection required. And by NextGen Sequencing, again, 8% of patients could not have a clonal uh, band identified. And so we have issues where not every patient may be valuable by these techniques. We talked already about the imaging and, and how that's important, and you can see that even if you're MRD negative, if you're imaging positive, um, and that's shown in these intermediate curves, that's still important. And so that's why the IMWG has not only the uh, MRD, but also imaging and MRD negative combined. And this really highlights, I think, the need in myeloma for blood-based testing as opposed to just purely marrow-based tests. We heard about flow, but one of the impacts in myeloma of flow is that CD38, which is an antigen that's often part of our myeloma panels in flow, we also have therapeutic antibodies targeting CD38. And so what happens when you give daratumumab, isotuximab, TAC079, and you deplete CD38 expression? And that's, sh that's shown here in this patient population, uh, where initially this patient is actually CD38 positive, but then after, uh, you can see it up here, but then after daratumumab treatment, it becomes CD38 negative. And so if you're going to call somebody uh, MRD negative and you're in a post-dara treatment, you need to use novel epitopes, and that's shown here, where somebody who looks CD38 negative with novel multi-CD38 epitopes can still be picked up. So important to alert pathologists that these patients are on CD38-based therapy. And just, I think we covered the, um, some of the initial testing techniques, but just the cost issues, uh, we're looking at anywhere from $200 to $700, 200 for flow, 700 for next-gen sequencing, and depending on radiology, 800 to $2,000. So again, the question would be asked, if you're gonna do these tests, how will your management change based on these results? Um, some exciting future techniques. Uh, there's been some work on circulating tumor DNA in myeloma. Um, one of the issues is that the amount of DNA matters. So when you lose the DNA amount, you really use, lose sensitivity. And also when you look at allelic fraction, um, the marrow is able to get much higher allelic fraction than the peripheral blood. So I think we still have a ways to go with circulating tumor. Uh, but as Prashant mentioned, I think mass spec is generating a lot of interest, some preliminary data for sensitivity up to the minus 10 to the minus 7th. And this is clearly blood-based testing. And what this study shows is that um, you can see this isotype of the patient very clearly detectable, even when you keep diluting the blood uh, and the IFE. Here you see a clear band in these lanes, but that as you've diluted it further, you can't see it as much, but it's very readily uh, determined by mass spec. And in, in this clinical trial, that did predict the development of mass spec negativity, did predict for better outcomes. So moving to the clinical analytics, um, what does MRD negativity mean? Timing, reproducibility, the impact of having prior MGUS, uh, what does high-risk disease mean, and the immune profile. And so this is the uh, same thing as an AML, as we, uh, Gail just closed with, 
MRD negativity uh, is not a plateau. We still see continued relapses. It, we have not attained a flat line in myeloma. And conversely, MRT, MRD positivity does not mean death or fat fatality. So I think we have to remember those issues. There's been a lot of interest in CAR-T, and um, CAR-T in myeloma has generated very dramatic results. And you can see on the left, the median PFS for CAR-T is 11.8 months and a median of seven lines of prior therapy. And that, that was very impressive. Um, given that our typical relapsed refractory patients who enter novel agents therapy have a PFS of around three to four months. So 12 months is very encouraging. There were MRD negative as well, but they, MRD negative had a much better PFS of 17.7 months. But again, no plateau, we're still seeing relapses. And so what is the meaning of MRD negativity? And one of the unusual things about CAR-T is you can often have the marrow clear very quickly, but you still have paraproteins that may be circulating around in the blood, perhaps due to the half-life issues. The timing and sustaining of MRD negativity matters. And so in this study, um, what's interesting is that patients with MRD negativity did better, um, but those who had converted from MRD negative to positive actually did just as badly as those who were positive to begin with. So this goes back to that, what if you had a bad sample your first time, uh, it was a hemodilute specimen, and you thought, okay, this is MRD negative, and then the next time it's positive? Well, you may have acted on an inadequate sample, and or biologically, if that patient went from negative to positive, that's going to impact this patient tremendously. And the same thing was shown with OS. So a single time point of MRD may not be enough. And even for regulatory purposes, where we we saw these clinical trials are showing uh, earlier uh, signs of deeper remissions, the sustaining of MRD might, it will probably be very important. And something that I think in myeloma is exceedingly important, and we've obviously in all diseases, but what is the biology? We talk about this MRD negativity and positivity, but what is exactly comprising those MRD positive cells? Are these early relapses? Is this residual stable disease? Does this need treatment? And if so, what treatment? And we have some very interesting studies that have shed some light on this. Um, and while we agree that we want to eradicate the tumor, get MRD negativity to try to get to, get to the cure, in myeloma, we know that uh, there was an interesting blood paper that showed that when you take newly diagnosed patients with myeloma and you go one year prior to the diagnosis, pretty much 90% of patients have detectable disease. And when you go to eight years prior, it's about 80%. So there, from vast majority of patients, there is an MGUS prodrome uh, or a smoldering prodrome prior to the diagnosis of myeloma. And what you can see here is that when you look at the patients who have an MGUS-like profile uh, by flow cytometry principal component analysis versus MGUS profile, they separate out very differently. So the MGUS profile does much better than those who have a myeloma profile. And so if we go chasing these patients who really have MGUS and trying to do a second transplant, multiple uh, additional treatments, how are we benefiting this patient who really just has MGUS? And we may have gotten rid of the bad clone that made them symptomatic. What about the immune microenvironment? So far, the MRD is focusing so much on the, the tumor, but what about the marrow and the microenvironment? How does that impact the residual disease? And this is another very interesting study that shows that if you have a favorable immune response, uh, that can actually supersede the persistent MRD. And so pa patients who had a favorable immune response shown here uh, actually did just as well as those who were MRD negative. And so it's not just the MRD, which is the end all and be all. And MRD, in high-risk patients, we've, we've heard that MRD negativity also matters in high-risk patients, but MRD negative patients who are high-risk still do worse than, uh, high-risk MRD negative patients still do worse than standard risk, so it's not overcoming the, the high-risk status in and of itself. So if somebody was high-risk and you had a single time point of MRD negativity, we can't be complacent and say, oh, we've done our job, we can move on. These patients will still have a higher likelihood of potentially relapsing and uh, inferior overall survival. And so I think this slide just really highlights that if we're going to use MRD in a truly rational scientific fashion, we need to understand the biology. What is the clonal selection that's happening at the different points? What are the genetic profiles, the transcriptomes, the phenotypes? Because if we're going to chase this residual MRD positive, we need to know what it is, who is the enemy, and then use our treatments accordingly. And then moving last to the, uh, the question of is myeloma a prognostic or predictive test? Um, Clearly, this is an invasive uh, procedure. Uh, this is, I think, a very interesting, the JAMA article, which is published, and we really should be applying this for every diagnostic test. First question, will these results help me in taking care of my patients? Will it change my management? So first, is MRD negativity a cure in myeloma? No. Is it the only predictor of a good long-term outcome? No. There are a lot of other predictors, which we'll see shortly. 
Does MRD status guide changes in therapy? And in particular, I think the questions that we all want to answer, and unlike some of the other diseases you've heard about, myeloma is often being treated in the community. At best, maybe 20% of patients are getting to academic medical centers. So if you're a community doctor practicing and you want to do the uh, MRD-based management of your treatment, if your patient attains MRD negativity, can you stop or de-intensify therapy? If you're positive, should you change and intensify your therapy? If you relapse from negative to positive, do you need to initiate therapy? And they, unfortunately, we have no answers for any of these studies. Um, those are all ongoing. You heard some examples of those studies, but we have no results. Second question is, will the reproducibility of the test and its interpretation be satisfactory in my setting? And you heard a lot about the sensitivity, specificity, the analytic issues, the heterogeneous marrow sampling, not clear. And will patients be better off as a result of the test? And it goes back to that question for medical students, if you want to order a test, how are you going to change your patient's management? And in 2019, we don't have a clear answer for that. So what are the other potential determinants of myeloma? Uh, we have not just MRD, but age and frailty we know is an independent predictor. For myeloma, a lot of our patients have renal insufficiency, and if renal insufficiency is not overcome, that's consistently negative prognostic finding. We have the burden of disease by international stage, LDH, molecular risk. And yes, we do have a depth of response MRD negativity, but to just focus in on that one test makes this seem very simple, and it's much more complicated than that. And we have patient disease and treatment factors that have to be integrated, and the MRD is one of those components. So my conclusions, what is the utility of MRD in myeloma? Our initial treatment is truly our best chance of deep and durable remissions, and if we need to get a handle of this disease, we do need more sensitive tests to pick up that uh, microscopic amount of disease. In randomized clinical trials, consistently we see that MRD by flow, next-gen sequencing, MRI, PET scans are definitively po uh, prognostic for PFS and OS. But when we get to testing analytics, we have specificity and pre-analytic issues. Not all myeloma patients are being tested in clinical trials. We're only testing those in CR and suspected CR. And so you can clearly have patients that may be MRD negative, but have positive disease by other methods. Sensitivity truly does matter. And you know, look at, as Gail mentioned too, you need to look at the number of events counted and what is the result that you're getting on your path report. We have about a 10% failure rate by both techniques. Um, myeloma, again, is a very heterogeneous disorder. You can have marrow involvement. We've seen patients who have uh, one side may be positive, another side may be negative, and it's very important to integrate radiologic techniques. In the future, I think very exciting MALDI-TOF mass spec. If you ask a patient, are you going to be disappointed to not have bone marrow biopsies anymore? No patient has ever said no, and I think that's really the future for us because we have a paraprotein-based disorder, and if you can detect that paraprotein by novel mass spec techniques, why subject patients to an invasive procedure which has sampling issues? And moving to the clinical analytics, MRD negativity is not a cure, positive is not fatal. Sustained MRD negativity is really important. Uh, we don't want to act on just one time point, especially when there's sampling issues. We've seen that the MGUS profile may be a cause of MRD positivity and does not confer any negative prognosis. In, and in, in addition, the immune microenvironment, if favorable, can actually override the MRD positivity. High-risk disease patients, high-risk patients we know consistently attain deep responses. It's the durability of response that's really important. And so a single time point, particularly for those patients, may not be enough. And finally, right now we have a lot of data showing that uh, MRD is a prognostic test, but right, it has not been shown to be a predictive test. It's an invasive procedure. Uh, we need blood-based testing. Multiple factors other than MRD affect myeloma outcomes. We have no data currently to alter the length of induction, the need for transplant, consolidation, or maintenance based on MRD results. I think perhaps the one area in real world where I have used MRD is in somebody who has low-risk disease and who's having toxicity from therapy, and we want to try to see if does this patient really need to be continued on the treatment, and that could be an off-label use of discontinuing therapy. But again, no prospective studies to guide that decision-making. And lastly, I think the best use of MRD for myeloma is going to be as a regulatory endpoint. Our patients are living great, uh, long lifetimes now, and for a newly diagnosed regimen, especially if we're going to do quad-based regimens where our PFS may be four years or higher, how are we going to improve on those regimens if we're waiting for years and years to get those results? So I think the regulatory endpoint is the easiest to start using MRD, um, and, and this is uh, going to be very exciting for our patients for new drug development. And um, with that, I'll thank you for your attention.